Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted, or they were afraid. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. And behold, the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly <clears throat> and fled from the sepulcher. For they trembled <clears throat> and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man. For they were afraid. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you now for the privilege that we have to be together in this place. I pray today, Lord, that number one, you'll sustain me and let me present the message you've given me. It's on my heart. And I pray for the, all those who are here. God, touch every heart. May the blessed Holy Spirit reveal truths to us today, and may we be reminded of the great price that was paid on our behalf for our salvation. Lord, just uh, reveal yourself to us today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today is a very special day in the hearts of believers around the world. It's a day that we celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus. He is the very foundation of our faith. It was a glorious day when the angel proclaimed to the, the, to the shepherds that the Messiah had come to earth. I'm thankful for his virgin birth, but without the finished work of Christ on the cross, our hope would be in vain. There'd be nothing to it. The songwriter said, had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for the old rugged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Had it not been for the suffering and the atonement, we'd all still be in our sins. Had it not been for his victory over death, hell and the grave, we would have no hope of eternal life. We'd be lost. Today is the day that we celebrate the fulfillment of God's promises to redeem us back to him. We're privileged to look back on the events of that first Easter morning. It was a day that began with a lot of doubt and a lot of despair, but it ended in rejoicing and hope. It's a day that so many years ago, uh, that it, it stands out as our promise of redemption and resurrection. I want us to take a few minutes this morning, go back to that barred tomb where Jesus' dead body was laid. As we examine the details of that day, I want to consider this thought. Triumph at the tomb. Triumph at the tomb. First of all, it was a morning of obscurity. We have to understand the context of this particular morning. The events of the past few days had left Jesus' followers kind of numb and confused. They didn't understand what was happening. Their faith had been tested and they were searching for answers. Things had not happened the way they thought they would. So what can we discover about this morning of obscurity in the lives of, of these women? Well, obviously they were suffering a lot of emotional pain. Uh, they had a close relationship with Jesus Christ. They believed that he was the promised Messiah. They had been, but he had been taken away after their lives had been transformed by this man called Jesus. Yet he'd been taken away, he'd been crucified, he'd been buried. It seemed as if their hopes and their dreams had been buried along with him. The one in whom they had placed their trust had been taken from them. 
The Romans were still in power. Their lives were still in danger because of their faith in Christ. They've, they've come to honor him at this particular time. They've come to honor him in the only way that they knew. They had come to anoint his body to provide honor and respect because they loved him dearly. We see a picture here of devastation and pain in their hearts. They were very passionate women. No doubt, after a sleepless night, they rose early and they came to the tomb. They were committed to doing all they could to ensure a proper burial for their Lord. But at the same time, they were no doubt concerned for their own safety because they stood for Christ. They saw the crowds as they cried, crucify him, crucify him. And then they saw the disrespect of the, of the Lord Jesus by the, by the crowds. These images the next morning were still fresh in their minds, but they were not deterred. They were concerned with honoring the one that they loved so dearly. As I read this account in Mark 16, the passion of these women challenged my heart. I remember as I, as I meditated and reread this and reread it, tears came to my eyes and they flowed down my cheeks as I thought about how it must have been for Jesus as he was so severely abused and, and beaten and crucified and, and dying on that cross between those two thieves. But then the women, his followers, those who loved him so much, how, how it must have been for them. We live in a day when there is little desire, not much thought, goes into honoring the Lord. Did you hear what I said? Not much thought goes into honoring the Lord. Many Christians, even, many, many people, even Christians, will not give much thought on this Easter Sunday to the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf. We'll plan a big dinner. We'll probably have an Easter egg hunt. Not many will take time to stop and meditate on what this day really means. May our passion for him be renewed and may there be a newfound commitment to him born within our hearts today as we as we honor and worship him. As these women approached the tomb, they were concerned about their own physical limitations. <clears throat> what am I saying? Well, they were aware that there was a large stone that had been placed in front of the tomb. They were aware that they were physically incapable of removing that stone in order to get to the body of Jesus. But they wanted to pay honor to Jesus and they wanted to anoint his body. They were going all out to get to him. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see much of that anymore. I don't see folks going all out to get to Jesus. They're trying to get away from Jesus. But uh, thank God for these, these, uh, these women. They were not looking, though, for a resurrected Lord, despite what he had told them. They didn't expect to find Jesus. They expected to find Jesus in his grave. Well, actually, wouldn't you have? If you'd seen him die and if you'd seen him put in the tomb. They were consumed with the apparent problem that was before them. And that was the stone that was in the way. That's what they were concerned with. They could see the death, but they did not see the deliverance. It's easy for us to wonder how they could have had such unbelief. They'd walked with him. They'd heard him speak of the, of the cross. They'd, that he had told them what was going to happen to him. That he had told them that he was going to rise from the grave. They'd heard all this. They had watched him perform his miracles. They had been with him, yet they were discouraged and they were filled with doubt but before we get too critical, let's take a look at our own lives. How many times have you experienced the mighty hand of God? 
How many times have you had prayers answered on your behalf or on behalf of a loved one? You prayed for them and you called, you called the, the parsonage and you said, would you put out a one call message? Uh, somebody's dying, somebody's critical, and we put out a message and we get everybody praying and pretty soon that person gets up and about and probably gets well. And what do we do? Not much. We just go on about our business. Thank God for answered prayer. Thank God that we have a, have a source to whom we can go when we're in trouble, when we are in need, when our body suffers pain and when the children get in trouble and when all sorts of things happen and fall apart, we can pray and pray and be confident that he will hear, that he will answer our prayer. Yet, some of us are, some of us are very unthankful for the things that God does for us. We ask and receive, but do not acknowledge. When he does something, if, if somebody on earth does something for you, very nice, you say thank you, right? Yeah. How about when Jesus does something for you? Do you take the time to sincerely be appreciative and say, Lord, I thank you. I know that that's an answer to prayer, and I honor you, and I thank you for that. Not too many. Some of us are here today, and we're trying to celebrate the hope of our faith. Yet we're burdened down with the cares of life. We must place our confidence in the risen Lord. Come unto me, he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I love the song in our hymn book that says, If the world for me withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and, key word, leave it there. What we more often do, we take our burden to the Lord and then we pick it right back up and carry it away. And we continue to carry that burden with us. He said, leave it there. Jesus came forth out of the grave. Is that not supernatural? Nothing in our lives that he's not aware of or that he doesn't have control over. You got that? Nothing in your life that Jesus Christ does not have control of. Amen. We're not here today to focus on death and despair, but we're here to focus on hope and eternity. Today should be a day of hope and the expectation of better things to come. I'm looking forward to a better day. I'm old and many physical setbacks. And to be quite honest with you, I'll just share this with you. I won't be around here long. I'll be gone, but don't you weep for me. I'm going to be in a better place than this. Then our message began with uh, a message of obscurity, but then we're going to end it with a message of victory. Message of victory. The women may have come with doubt and despair, but their despair was about to be turned into victory. As they came to the tomb, the very thing that had worried them so much had been removed and more, than, more often than not, that is the case. We worry and worry and fret and fret about this. What if this happens? What if that happens? Usually it doesn't happen. The things we worry the most about doesn't happen. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Quit walking around with, the, with, with your chin so low that if you aren't careful, you'll step on it. Look up. Redemption draweth nigh. As they came to the tomb, rather than seeing a cold, dead body, there was an angel who had a message of victory. He spoke words of comfort. He said, be not affrighted 
or, or don't be afraid. You don't have anything to be afraid of. They came to the tomb with their hearts filled with fear. The Lord sent words of comfort through the angel. Their focus had been on death, but victory had come with the dawn. Jesus no longer was in the tomb. He was alive. Alive. Jesus lives today. I am so glad for the comfort and the peace that Christ brings in our lives. He comforts the brokenhearted, the lonely, the, the afraid. There may be limitations that uh, are situations beyond your control. But take courage. Hope is not lost. Hope is not lost. Jesus, Jesus is there to comfort you when you're in trouble. Trust in him. Don't trust in man. Don't trust in your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, your wife. Trust in him. He never fails. Never. Amen. He spoke. The angel spoke words of confidence. He said, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. The angel was well aware of why they'd come. They had come to anoint the body of Jesus. They had come to honor Jesus. He wanted them to know that their search, their faith had not been in vain. Jesus was all they believed him to be and so much more. And I think the angel wanted them to know that. Jesus was everything that they had thought he was before they began to doubt him. And even more. Hope had not ended with the tomb. The world may claim that our faith is vain. And they do. You know, the world mocks Christians. Uh, the news programs, the, the, all the sitcoms and things on TV, uh, they, they make fun of, make light of Christians and portray us as Poor, ignorant hillbillies and things like that. One day, we'll find out, won't we? One day, we'll, we'll find out. I want our faith today. Today, I want our faith and our confidence to be renewed in the power of a risen Christ. We've been saved by his precious blood and we belong to him. We're his. We've been bought with a price. Since we've been bought with a price, we belong to the one who bought us. <clears throat> that being Jesus Christ. We've been saved by his precious blood. The world's perception, what the world thinks of me and what the world thinks of you does not hinder our salvation or diminish our hope one iota. It just really emboldens me when I, when I am referred to as a backwoods ignoramus. It really does. <clears throat> Our faith is not something <clears throat> that we can. <clears throat> excuse me. Our faith is not something that we can hold in our hands. But the songwriter says it's real. Oh, it's real. Yes, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled, for I know, I know it's real. I know. How do I know? First of all, I have the testimony of God's word. And secondly, I have the testimony of God's spirit that lives in my heart. God's spirit leads me. He guides me. He directs me. Tells me when to open my mouth and when to shut it. Tells me when to do this, do that, and when not to do this, do that. Sometimes we kind of we kind of get depressed. We get in a place where we think that we have no no uh, other resource or recourse, and we hardly know what to do. And we just come to the end of our rope. Well, let me tell you, when you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hold on. Look to Jesus. He's the same 
yesterday, today, and forevermore. Yes, he died. Yes, they buried him. But he rose again. He's not in that grave today. He's not in that tomb today. He lives. He lives. He spoke words. This angel that we're talking about spoke words of conquest in the latter part of verse 6. He said, he is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. He said, look over here. Here's where he was. Here's where he was. It's empty. He's not there anymore. Aren't you glad for a risen Savior? Aren't you glad? Boy, we get so, we get so preoccupied with the things of this world, our selfish desires and the things that we, we, the things that I want, the things that we want, that we totally forget about who owns us, forget about who bought us. Now, I've never been there, but the tomb is empty. I've talked to people who have been there. And I have the word of God. And it says the tomb is empty. No other religion can say this. No other religion can say the tomb is empty. Jesus Christ rose victorious over hell and the grave. Nothing could hold him. Jesus was not. Jesus was not the first to rise from the dead. You're aware of that, right? There were others who rose from the dead, but he was the first one to rise and die no more. He ever liveth at the Father's right hand. I'm happy about that. I'm happy that when I pray, I'm not praying to the four walls of my house or to the ceiling of my house or to some dead God. I'm I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I know My Savior sits at his Father's right hand and his ear is ever tuned to the the praying heart of the Christian, the believer. And you say, well, I pray a lot. I pray a lot. But no, I've never been saved. Well, you might as well be praying to to the dead, to the four walls. God does not hear the prayer of an unsaved person. Why do I, how can I say that? Because that's what the Bible teaches. He only hears the prayer of Jesus Christ. And we go to Jesus Christ and through him, God hears our prayer. Through him. So I pray to Jesus and Jesus turns around and he says, my father, there's old Jerry down there. He's got some needs that need to be taken care of today. That's the way it works. And if you don't know Jesus, you're wasting your time with your praying. Unless you want to pray, dear God, I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. But I believe Jesus died for me. And right now, the best I know how, I'm willing to receive him into my heart. Come into my heart and save me. He'll hear that prayer. And then, Jesus becomes your mediator at that point. So, death can't hold a child of God. One day all the dead in Christ shall come forth as the graves burst open in victory. Death cannot hold the child of God. If you're saved, you're going to live forevermore. When you close your eyes in what we call death, the Bible says for to, for to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Thank God. I love the old song, when I come to the river at the ending of day, when the last winds of sorrow have blown, there'll be somebody waiting to show me the way and I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Aren't you happy? You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear when your eyes are closed in death. With my Jesus, I'll be at rest. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Our body will one day be placed in the cold, dark ground. Maybe sooner than later, who knows? Maybe you. I may be standing over your, your uh, casket uh, for doing a funeral. Had one, had one uh, Friday in Princeton. A friend of mine that I'd known for probably 50 years, he was 93, and he went to be with the Lord. And I remember talking to him not, so, not real long ago. Hadn't seen him for a while, but probably the last time I talked to him, I, he, he had kind of gotten away from the Lord, to be honest with you. He had, uh, his wife had died and his son had, had died and he was lonely and he lived alone, kind of became a hermit and uh, never got out much. But one day I was by his house and I happened to see him on the porch and I stopped and I talked to him a while. I said, I called him my name. I said, how's your relationship to the Lord? Well, he said, needs some improvement really. Not what it ought to be. I said, well, let me, t- let me ask you something. Do you know for sure, absolute certainty, that you're going to heaven when you die? He said, now, you could ask me a lot of things and I couldn't answer, but I can answer that one. Yes, sir. I remember the day that God saved my soul. And to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, and that's my plans. And I, I could stand over, stand at that service and tell the, tell the family, my last conversation with Charlie. It's good to be able to do that. Amen. How would it be if I had your funeral? What could I say about you? Could I say for sure that I know beyond any shadow of doubt that you've been saved? Could I? Yeah. If I can't say that, then don't ask me to do your funeral. I have trouble with that. <laughs> But when I'm gone, and when you walk away from that grave, that's not going to be the end of me. I'm going to rise in a new resurrected body one day, and I'm going to look at you and say, I told you so. I told you so. I told you I was going to rise again. I told you. Much of what we hear today Brings very little comfort, doesn't it? We turn on the TV. All we see is death, destruction, despair. We look at what's going on in other parts of the world, in Ukraine, and it's it's horrible. Horrible what we see. I don't watch much of that. I just don't. I I can take it in real small doses, but not, not not big doses. If I could help anybody, I'd watch it, but I can't. So why watch it? But I have some good news this morning. My Savior lives. The Savior lives. <clears throat> and one day, <clears throat> one day he's coming for us. He's going to take us home. We've never seen the, our Lord. <clears throat> but one day we will. I'm going to see him one day. We're promised that one day Jesus is going to return for his own. In First Thessalonians, a passage that all of us are familiar with, <clears throat> the Lord said through the Apostle Paul, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, And with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What a rejoicing, wonderful time when we see him face to face. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me? What a day. Today ought to bring hope, hope and joy to our hearts. We have the hope of a brighter day ahead. I'll tell you, if all there was 
If all there was was what we see in this world, life would, would not be worth living. I understand. I fully understand why there are a lot of suicides. Do you understand that? People without hope. Why go on in this mess, in this world? Why go on? Just end it. But there is hope. There's a risen Savior. And I can introduce you to him. For those who are Christ rejectors, not so much. Don't have much good to say that will comfort you. You'll hide your face from him. You will. You'll cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on you in that day. Today is a very special day. We've worshipped and celebrated the resurrection of our King. I'm looking forward to the day when he calls for the church and the dead in Christ begin to rise. I've made preparation for that day. You know, we have to make preparations for just about anything. If you take a trip, you've got to prepare. You've got to know the way. You've got to know the direction, the routes. I've made preparations. Have you? Listen carefully. Have you made preparations for that day? Do you know Jesus as the Savior of your soul? Have you been washed in his precious blood? If you've, if you've never been saved... Boy, Easter Sunday would be a wonderful day to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. What a time. Maybe, you've, maybe you have been saved. Maybe at some point you were saved. But you've never made a public profession of your faith. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You need to tell somebody. Perhaps you need to be baptized in obedience to the command of God. I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to come and take your stand for Christ. We're going to pray. Following this prayer, we're going to sing, Just as I am without one plea. And I'm going to invite you to come. Take your stand for Christ today. Will you do it? Father, we thank you now in Jesus' name for all your blessings. You're so good to us. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for that. And I ask, dear God, today that you'll speak to the hearts of these who are here, perhaps some without Christ. Maybe some have made that decision to trust him. and They need to make a public decision public confession. Lord, enable us today to respond to your calling. Enable us today, Lord, to honor you in the best way we know how. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.